So today I want to be talking about finding the metric that matters. My name is Rhys Jackson, I'm the Head of Data and Insight at Rocket Mill and today I want to share with you uh, an approach that we've refined here to help inform your marketing strategy with data. We'll be covering everything from data collection, audience research, segmentation, right the way through to media targeting and attribution. But first I thought a good way to start would be by trying to talk about the role of an analyst within the organisation. So, one definition of an analyst role is to improve understanding and inform decision making with data. It sounds fantastic and it's great, but if you're anything like me, you've probably seen a few talks like this before and you're left thinking, hang on, I've heard a lot of talks about data-driven attribution. You go back to the office and you're scratching your head and you're not quite sure how to put it into action. So hopefully throughout this talk, there'll be a few little bits and bobs that you can take away and put into action straight away. In my view, creating a data-led strategy requires three really crucial things. The first of which, of course, is data. It's self-explanatory. Without data, you don't have anything to analyze. But every business has access to enormous and ever-increasing amounts of data. So data by itself clearly isn't enough to differentiate. And that's because data is passive. It doesn't shout answers at you. It doesn't have an agenda. Um, and of course, it goes without saying that the quality and the integrity of data is directly reflected in the quality of the insights and the analysis that you draw from it. The next key ingredient is context, and context is the insider and knowledge of how your business works and how it operates. It's the challenges, the constraints, the opportunities within your business. And uh, context gives focus to your analysis. It ensures the outcomes of your analysis are relevant and pragmatic, and they're meaningful to your business. And finally, the secret source to using data effectively is creativity. And we quite often think as data and creativity as almost polar opposites of each other, but it can be further from the truth. We need creativity in data because there's no textbook out there that will tell you how to solve the specific problems that your business is facing. We need a creative approach to problem solving to apply our uh, data and analytical skills creatively to problems that nobody else is facing. And when done effectively, um, Use of creativity within data can create a competitive advantage because you're solving problems that nobody else has solved quicker and better than your competitors. So getting into the detail, I'd like to talk to you about a, a process of continual improvement. And as many of you will know, we can broadly categorize data into one of two different types. We have qualitative data and we have quantitative data. And qualitative data is descriptive and it's fluffy, but it really helps us understand the how and the why of behavior. Quantitative data, on the other hand, is really objective and numerical. It can be counted. But it helps us understand what, where, and when. And knowing when and how to leverage both of these different types of data is absolutely crucial in a data strategy. So in a process of continual improvement, we might typically look at a process like this. All great ideas, all great changes come from an initial gut feeling, an instinct, or an intuition about how a customer might be behaving or how your audience are perceiving your product. And from there, you might want to go out and you can conduct qualitative research to quickly and rapidly expand your understanding of your hypothesis, get new ideas, and begin to elaborate on your gut feelings. From there, you can create hypotheses. You're equipped with all this great qualitative information. You can create hypotheses to test, and you can experiment. You can gather numerical data and quantitative proof through tools like Google Analytics to be able to understand how effective has our experiment been. And finally, something we don't often hear talked about a lot, but it's critical to deploy these findings at scale. Once we've learned something, we need to get it in front of as many people as possible, whether that's through personalization or through advertising or through media creative, whatever it might be. Once we have our learnings, we need to exploit them. And as you might have noticed, the general trend here is that we move from qualitative to quantitative data. To give you an example of where this has been used really effectively, uh, I want to share a story from Airbnb. I really, really like this story. Um, it's a fantastic example of this, this cycle of continual improvement. So cast your mind back to summer of 2009, and Airbnb was kicking off. Um, but they were really struggling to get traction in New York. And at the time, their biggest competitor for people renting or leasing apartments for short periods, um, their biggest competitor was Craigslist. Um, but they were really struggling to enter into this New York market. So the two founders wanted to go and find out why. So they, they flew over to New York, and the two of them uh, leased 25 apartments with their hosts. And they stayed in each one, and they interviewed and gathered qualitative data from each of their hosts. 
And it turns out while they were there, they were asking all sorts of questions, you know, what, what sort of accommodation do you give these people? How do you advertise and so on? It turned out that all of these people were taking uh, pictures of their apartments on their iPhones. And in 2009, the cameras weren't quite as great as we have now. Um, and essentially, they decided that the quality of the photography and the imagery they were putting up, I think they referred to it as Craigslist quality, which is not what they were, not what they were going for. So they hypothesized, they thought, if we got a professional photographer, if we had professional style photography on our website, would that increase the number of bookings with our hosts in New York? So they went out and they hired a $5,000 camera for a, for a few days. And they went around and they took professional quality photos themselves. They put them online. And over the next few weeks, they saw two to three times more bookings at these apartments um, that were using this professional quality um, photography. So the next, next step, of course, is to scale it. They hired 20 professional photographers around the world. Um, and this led to similar growth in Paris, Miami, Vancouver, and London, and led to the Airbnb that we know today. One thing to emphasize, of course, is throughout this process, there should be kind of an almost relentless focus on one metric that matters. And the one metric that matters is going to be the one that best describes your business's current pain. Everything else should be a considered a distraction throughout this process. And of course, you might have different met metrics at different levels of the business, you know, the board level, the team level, the product level, even, even down at the project level, you might have different metrics that you're focusing on. But there should always be a consistent focus on the metric that best describes the problem you're trying to solve. But of course, this begs the question, what makes a metric worth measuring? Now, you've all seen metrics like this, of course. You've got users, sessions, bounce rate, page views, lovely stuff. We all have access to all of this. But I very, very much doubt that page views is the metric that gets your, gets your CEO out of bed in the morning that he can't wait to check on his way into work. Because page views doesn't have an inherent business value. What does make a metric matter, in our experience, we've kind of shortlisted these five different metrics that we find useful. And number one is that a good metric will force you to make a decision. So think about um, what would you do if this metric were changed? If it doubled overnight, what would, how would that change the way you operate? Second, a metric should clarify understanding. So if it does change, especially when you're testing, if you have a preconception about what you're trying to change and what direction that metric might take once making the change, it should help you understand a little bit more about the customer or the intent. Third, good metrics are typically rates or ratios. It tells you it's more important to know about the rate of change rather than the absolute quantity in the vast majority of cases. For example, if I told you that business is up 75% year on year, that's generally a lot more meaningful than telling you we've got an extra 500 sales year on year. It gives you a sense of scale. Good metrics are also used comparatively as well. So this could be um, you know, very simply looking at period on period, year on year, for example. But more importantly, it could also be used to compare to a forecast. Good metrics should be, um, you should have an idea of where they're going, and you can look proactively into the future and use them comparatively. And finally, a good metric should be actionable. So if you don't feel you can have a tangible impact on the metric that you're trying to monitor, then perhaps it's not the right metric for the particular change or the problem that you're trying to solve. With all this in mind, I wanted to kind of describe how we can put this into action and begin collecting a lot of this data. And this is something I call the, the Google Analytics Context Toolkit. It sounds fancy, but it's essentially just a, a bucket of different features and functionality within Google Analytics that we can put into play to help us with defining and measuring these metrics. And there are things like uh, custom dimensions, custom metrics, user timings, event tracking, you name it. And to give you an example of how this might, what that might look, here's an example of performance by author. We've got uh, Chris Philpot, John Hibbett, John Norris. Um, if you imagine, for example, this is a publisher who is hiring freelancers to come and write for them, and they're all pretty pricey, but they want to know which freelancers they should hire in the future and, and give them repeat business. This kind of custom dimension in this case would be very, very useful to understand who is, which of the authors that are performing most effectively. In this example, we're looking at form completion timings. Think for a moment about a B2B business whose, um, whose existence lives and dies on the fact that people can a are able to complete their online form successfully and efficiently. Immediately, we can see this is uh, the amount of time it takes users to complete each form. Immediately, we can see which forms might need some optimization, which forms are ones that we could begin to improve. And finally, this is uh, event tracking, looking at quote searches by make, model, and price. And um, we can see the, the searches that people have been making on a vehicle leasing website. And immediately, you can start to kind of see differences or imagine differences between the different types of customer or audience that we could be targeting. For example, the user searching for a budget Volkswagen is likely going to be a very different type of customer from those searching for the Audi A3 or Mercedes-Benz. 
Which brings me on to using this context to define custom audiences. And we can use this in our media targeting. So traditionally, uh, I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with personas. And personas are a fantastic tool. They allow us to understand our audience better. And uh, we can conduct research to broadly create different categories or different kind of archetypes of different people within our main audience. And these are fantastic for getting a, a better understanding of who we might be targeting. But they are, by definition, they're essentially a stereotype within our audience. But they're not necessarily reflections of actual individuals or people that we might be targeting through our media. If we contrast personas to the, the capabilities with digital media targeting for a moment, you can see that we're able to use these different contextual events and moments that we've captured through our Google Analytics Context Toolkit. And we can layer them on top of each other to create a much more realistic indication of what our audience and our individual customers are like. They're actually made up of varying traits and strengths of different qualities and behaviors that they exhibit on a website. And we can put this into action by creating a, here's a kind of a map for an, exam, uh, an example on our own Rocket Mill website, where we can take visitors and traffic in through the top. And based on the different behaviors that they exhibit on our website, we can segment and categorize them into different buckets varying by different levels of commercial intent um, and relevancy and value to our business. And then based on that, we can create campaigns that are targeted and personalized towards the, the individuals who are exhibiting those behaviors. And these are really, really easy to set up. So in Google Analytics, we can create segments. For example, here we're looking at uh, an individual or an audience of people who are interested in SEO by virtue of their visiting the technical SEO page. We add the segment, we can give it a name, click the conditions button, define the conditions, and save it. And finally, we can click the build audience button. And this can be pushed straight into AdWords, or if you're a 360 customer, into double click as well. And we can advertise directly to these custom audiences that are built on observable first party data that we have gathered. Now let's just take a step back to appreciate the, the significant differences between traditional targeting and digital targeting. Now, I'm not for a minute suggesting that one way is better than the other. Of course, uh, any, any effective strategy is very likely going to contain an effective mix of all of the right components of both traditional and digital targeting. A traditional approach might be to conduct consumer research with focus groups, generate personas. You might then identify the relevant media outlets and produce the appropriate creative. You then distribute it to the audience, all the time having to accept that there will be a significant amount of wa wastage, both due to the extensive research and the delivery method, which is uh, a very wide uh, audience, the vast majority of which may not be the target customer that you're going after. Contrast that with the digital approach that we've just discussed, and we can go beyond personas and towards personalized targeting. We can drastically reduce the wastage by targeting the right audience based on observable behaviors. And then we can increase the irrelevancy by tailoring different messages to different audiences. So I wanted to leave you with a few next steps and takeaways. From here, you'll want to make sure that everybody can understand and learn from the analysis that you're producing. It's a misunderstanding to believe that data belongs solely in the hands of analysts. A part of an analyst's role is to develop a culture of sharing and communication of facts. One of the most effective ways to do this is through reporting and visualization. The days of manually pulling together an Excel report at 9 a.m. every Monday morning are well and truly over, thank God. With tools like Tableau, Power BI, and Data Studio, reports can be beautiful, interactive, and always up to date. Building automated reports shifts the focus away from compiling reports to analyzing reports, which carry significantly greater business value. So my three takeaways to leave you with. Number one, find the metric that matters. Focus relentlessly on that. And as soon as you've overcome that metric, you may need to redefine. And of course, there might be different metrics at varying levels of the business. But make sure that there is, is absolute focus. Number two, business context is, is king. We spoke about this Google Analytics context toolkit. You need to inject the business context, the business relevancy to be alongside your first party data. Using things like events, custom dimensions, user timings, and all of the things that are disposable in whatever analytics tool you might be using. And finally, we're now in an era of people-based marketing. We, we no longer have to rely on very broad approximations or personas of our target audiences. And as ad tech continues to develop, this capability is no longer limited to just search and display or sort of traditional digital media. Right at this moment, you can go out and you can programmatically buy radio and TV. And digital is no longer just a channel. It's the method that we're more consistently using to buy all media. Thank you very much for listening.